in the corner. Uh, I'm now retired, which I can recommend, it's a good thing. Um, I'm sure many of you will have thought that given recent workload reports, etc. Um, before that I used to work as a teacher for about 19 years and I went to the National Curriculum Council to write the National Curriculum or parts of it uh, and then finished up the QCA as Executive Director for Education where I was responsible from 2008 for National Curriculum Tests which explains the shape of my nose basically, why that uh, came about. So I'm going to do quite a number of things. Uh, I've called this a health check uh, the life after levels. I think the, the kind of good news is that there is life after levels. Uh, and I can assure you I'm old enough there was actually life before levels, uh, if any of you are about around then. One of the issues I think that we've got is the average age of a teacher, according to OECD, is about 43 years old. I'm just looking around trying to work out our average age now to say that. Uh, if you're around that average age, I think anything up to about 46 years of age, you've probably spent your entire teaching career under levels, under the national curriculum. And I think that raises a number of issues that in my day, which is going back before electricity and indoor toilets in Huddersfield, um, <laughs> we had to do things like develop our own curricula, we had to develop our own assessments. It can be done, but I'm not terribly sure that the, many of the current generation have got some of those skills. They can get them, it's not impossible, teachers are bright, they're very bright, very adaptable. But I don't think they've come through with some of those skills, which is why we've had challenges of late. And we've had lots of challenges, as you, as you all know, with the accountability system, lots of things constantly creeping out of the system. I'm going to go through a little bit of background, but I'm going to lead you towards the end uh, with some examples, some schools who are actually coming through this, who've certainly got life in their veins, and gushing through their veins. I'll give you the names of those schools, I'm going to name them, not name and shame, because these are schools who are really making massive efforts. Uh, and all the stuff that I'm talking about will be available, uh, some of it today, uh, the exemplification materials I'm going to mention, uh, and videos and insights into all of the schools that I'm going to mention over the weekend. This is all through Frog Education, they've got some stuff at the back and they can give you out and uh, give you details about that. So you're well aware of all the, uh, the rush, the push and the changes We've had change is not a bad thing. Teachers have been used to this since about 1988 since we had uh, the Education Reform Act. That constant change with GCSE, primary, whatever. But one of the key things, I'm sadly I think we're just kind of missing this a little bit because of all the push around levels and trying to find replacements for levels and people trying to ge generate data that looks pretty similar up to levels, which I think is a bad thing by the way, but I'll come to that uh, later. I think we've forgotten some of the fundamental issues that we're trying to address here. There's a real shift. The recent changes to national curriculum, it's not like some of the more superficial changes we've had over the last 10, 15 years. This is a change in emphasis, a change in philosophy. The move to, to, to master, deeper learning, etc. All the things that you're are, are banding around. And we've really got to take grips with what those are about before we start generating data. If we don't have a good, sound, progressive curriculum, if we don't have good, sound assessment techniques, then the data that we generate is largely meaningless. No matter how pretty it looks, it's meaningless. So we need some good, valid data. And one of the things I've come across in schools is that many people have picked up the national curriculum and kind of carried on as though not an awful lot's happened in terms of uh, some of the teaching. You will know more than most that the that new curriculum is more demanding. Things that are in key stage three, uh, now in key stage two. Uh, we've also got fancy things like Roman numerals, which is a massive breakthrough for society. Uh, <laughs> one of the things that intrigues me is there's a difference between what we can call the intended curriculum, that is the thing that is up on a website or in a book, the thing that we say we're going to deliver, as opposed to the one that is enacted. And that's the one that actually gets delivered in classrooms. And I've seen lots of examples, sadly, where there's a disjoint. One of the things I've, uh, I've done with schools of late is sit with them and talk about their curriculum. Not with the head or the deputy or a willing, newly qualified teacher, but the entire staff. And I just wonder whether you've done that, whether you've actually walked through your entire curriculum from year one to six or to nine or whatever it is, and talked about it in some detail. It's an amazing thing to do because you start to find some strange things happening in the classrooms. Things that are not taught that you thought were taught. <laughs> things that are taught earlier than you thought they were to be taught. So the intended and the enacted can be very, very different 
different beasts. And of course, there's a bit that we assess, which is generally a subset of the curriculum, and then there's a bit, the end important bit, is what the kids actually learn. That's the bit that's key in all of this. Uh, one of the things that you are required to do, um, Education and Regulations Act, I'm sure you all have readers of such, uh, one of the things that you've got to do on your school website is to have, uh, in relation to each year group, the content of the curriculum for each academic subject. Now again, one of the advantages of being uh, retired and living in Huddersfield, there's not much to do. So one of the things I do as a little hobby is I look at the school website a lot. This is a sad admission. I'd be very grateful if you don't pass this on to anybody, but it's something that I do. And I don't generally see an awful lot that is good, to be honest. Some of the curricula I see posted on websites are kind of strange. Some of them are different. If you look at secondary schools in particular, you get different, uh, different energy from English to maths to science, whatever it is. And very few of them really actually cover what is meant to be covered by this act. And this was uh, back to my <coughs> letter from, from Nick Gibson time back. Now this is a regulation, this is something you're supposed to do. Uh, an example there, uh, I can get to dozens and dozens of examples. This is what you get for a particular example of the school curriculum. This is a primary school. Uh, and the only thing I can really glean from that as an outsider uh, is that in 2000, whatever it is, the bottom 15 and 16 in the spring term, they'll be looking at bumps, bottoms, and bile. Uh, that doesn't give me an awful lot of insight into what is actually going on in that curriculum. PCHC is no different, and again, as I mentioned, from one department uh, to the other. Sadly, I've been into some of these schools. When you go into them and look at schemes of work, you get quite a different picture. There's a lot of work that sits behind these, obviously, I've been slightly facetious. But nevertheless, when you get in and start talking, you do find that some people do run from a curriculum not much more detail than the one uh, I've just shown. So one of my key issues is about <coughs> really need to understand uh, what uh, progression looks like in, this, in the subjects that we teach. And this is, again, a challenge. It's a challenge for someone to sit down with an English, math, science specialist or whatever and explain in some reasonable detail what progression looks like in that subject. What does it look like from a five-year-old to a six-year-old? to a 14 to a 15 year old. It's quite a difficult skill in many ways, and it also demonstrates the grasp of subject knowledge that people have. I did some work in a, a school some years ago now. Uh, they were looking at design and technology. That was their focus. <coughs> they weren't sure whether uh, they were delivering this properly, and they wanted to have a chat about it. So God bless them, they all came into school on a Saturday morning. And the first thing I asked them to do was rather just talk about what they do, just go and fetch me some things from the classrooms that the kids actually make, anything, anything manufactured whatsoever by the kids. So off they went, and within seconds the first teacher came back, and she plonked on the staff room table a uh, Greek, uh, you know, the papier mache thing made around the balloon, and you pop the balloon and pay it in. That was a fun you can have with that. Um, second teacher came in a few minutes later with a bunch of things and the papier mache uh, thing, and the third one, and the fourth one, and the fifth one. By the time the last one came, the other teachers were in fits of giggles because they kind of hoping that she wouldn't come in with yet another Greek uh, herb. <laughs> the upshot of that is that in that school, every year, the kids made a Greek herb. <laughs> every year. I could tell you where it is, because if you drive round there on an evening and look through into front rooms, I'm not suggesting you do this by any shape or form, but if you do, you will see proudly displayed on pianos and sideboards <laughs> six little Greek urns that the kids have made at school. The sad thing is, the Greek urns didn't get any better. They peaked in year three and then went downhill. But the teachers didn't realise that that was going on. I, my proposition is that I the equivalent of Greek urns in maths and in reading and in writing and in science, where we're kind of going over the stuff. And we need to kind of shake that off. When I went to uh, work on the National Curriculum many years ago, so I hadn't been there terribly long, I was sent off to meet, uh, meet the uh, HMI who had been given the job of rewriting the National Curriculum. Again, if you're old enough, you'll remember uh, that the National Curriculum was the first ones that came out for science and maths. I think they lasted about three months before they were rewritten. Uh, we used to have 19 attainment targets or whatever it was. You think you've got it, Ruth? You should have seen it then, it was amazing. And one of the things that they were doing, it was uh, being rewritten by Ofsted, I was sent down to chat to them to look at what they were doing, uh, and they wanted to talk to me about progression. This was in 11s. And they started off at in level one, this was in design and technology, 
uh, that children should be able to cut wood in strip. Converter, that means thin wood. Yeah? Uh, level two, it got a little bit more difficult. The wood we got became thicker. It was wood in section. So this is how they described progression within that subject. So if you kind of follow this through, when you get to <laughs> upper set, up at the end of primary school, you'll be cutting planks. If you go on to GCSE, you'll get rocks. And if you get on to A11, you'll be then cutting trees down. Now, I don't think that is a form of progression. It's a kind of a strange thing to be able to do. You can look this up if you look back over the 1992-93 version, you'll find reference to cutting wood in section. So I think the challenge for us uh, within schools is to think about what progression looks like. We've got a number of uh, assets in this, if you like. We know the kids sent to school at around five and they leave around 18 and they do various things within there doing a baseline assessment, um, which is another interesting area to have talk for hours on that one as well. Uh, but going through various things, like you said, one, two assessments. What I think we need to do as a professional is to be able to fill in the blanks could you explain to me within your subject the difference between a child who's eight and nine? The type of things they should be able to do, the things that would show you that a child has moved from being eight to nine, or whatever it is, that's a simplistic age thing. But we have to start filling those gaps and articulating them, not just internalising them, but sharing them with other colleagues so that we have, we have a picture. One of the issues we've got is all the stuff around us is shifting. Uh, we don't know what the baseline assessment is going to shape up. We've got so we three of them last year, and then they came out with a report to say that they couldn't uh, compare the three, uh, which was obvious to anybody who got half a brain that that was going to be the case. You can't compare things that are just so different as they are. Uh, but we've got key stage one, two, the standards are changing, as we know, and the same with GCSE. A level standard is being retained, but the mode of assessment is different. They're going for linear uh, rather than modular. So changes right the way through, changes in standards, and I think it's more important than ever that as a school, as a group of teachers, we understand what that looks like and how our standard relates to the expected at levels nationally. So in terms of teacher assessment, we've got a strange uh, arrangement at the, at the moment uh, where we've got teacher assessments which are uh, the best fit has got, and that's disappeared uh, entirely. Uh, we've got level descriptions about pupils can statements, and then we've got the removal of the link between formative school assessment and national summative. And the link is pretty, has been destroyed when you look at it. We've got teacher assessment, which is based on a mastery model for key stage one and two with the various descriptions. Yet we've still got national tests that's not a compensator. That is, a child can score highly on one question, which compensates for low performance on another. So the mode of assessment is mixed, it's confused, and that's uh, not, not a good thing. Uh, and it's the same if you look through, if you look at DCC and, and uh, an air level with issues there around the removal of coursework and controlled assignments. I was reading in the paper this morning, there's a big piece in the, in the Times tucked away in the middle, a uh, teacher, a group of teachers being brought before a tribunal for cheating on controlled assignments. And one of the issues we've got, and it is a massive issue, uh, I was involved with the uh, National Association of Act Teachers did a, a commission on assessment a couple of years ago now. And the saddest thing I heard from the evidence that was presented there was the number of people who talked about the lack of trust in teacher assessment. The lack of trust. This wasn't people outside the profession, by the way. This was people within. And it wasn't the kind of usual thing about key stage three or secondary not trusting the, the key stage two assessment. This was the year seven teacher not trusting the year six, or the year six not trusting the year five. And it's kind of worrying we have to fix that. If we don't fix that as a profession, we will continue, in my view, to be dictated to by politicians and others. We've got to find a way through this to build the trust within the profession, to unite within the profession, to start showing that we can assess and assess validly and reliably. We're not there yet. We need to work on, on that. And then we've got, as you know, uh, within the type of interim, interim teaching assessments, which are have uh, been slightly modified, reading and writing are remaining the same, I understand, for next year. Um, mathematics for Key Stage 2 is going to be exemplification, which is going to be uh, altered slightly and updated in the light of feedback that the department have received. But again, we've got some kind of strange things going on with this. We've removed levels, yet within that we've got things like working towards, working at the expected and working 
a greater depth. Now, one advantage of interim frameworks, at least those things are defined by looking at uh, the expected uh, the criteria that are given to measure those things. But one of the things that worries me uh, with other people, we've started to invent terms like emerging, uh, exceeding. I don't know what those things mean. I'm still emerging. Personally, I've been emerging for a long time. <laughs> um, I'm sick of emerging. I don't quite understand what those terms mean. If you're asking a child if the standard you're looking to is a child can count to 100, what does emerging mean in that context? 99, 63, and if they can exceed that target, are we on 101 or 372? Some of these terms, I think, that we've started to use are understandable, and you can see why people are doing them, but we need to have a little bit of think about why, uh, what those terms actually mean underneath. Otherwise, we've invented levels again, except this time we've all got a slightly different definition of what they are. And one of the issues about the master, and again, if you uh, if you think back, if you were teaching around the early 90s, the first model of national curriculum was very much on a master level. We had in, uh, in uh, geography five attainment targets and ten levels, and we had the same issue there. If a child missed one of the bullet points within those, they're all brought down to A, B, C, D, F, G, and H in some cases, they miss one of those, they go down to the level below in the same way as we've now got for key stage one and two. The issue behind that was that kids tumbled like stones through the levels as they missed one little bullet point, yet they had attributes of the higher levels. And a chap called Ron Deering, and later Lord Deering, reviewed all of that in 1994-95 and came up with the idea of best fit, which is what we've had ever since until uh, the recent uh, installation of uh, the, uh, the work that's been produced by, by SDA. Now, I'm not, again, that person. It's clear in many ways. It's straightforward. But it does have some kind of strange effects. I know these things in the handwriting was one particular thing I think that people were quite exercised about. And I knew some schools that were saying that we don't uh, concentrate on cursive writing uh, in Key Stage 2. But having got those little bullet points, they're going to spend the next three weeks doing cursive writing to produce some stuff for moderation. But this is kind of the worst motivation for doing these things. This is teaching to the, the test or the teacher assessment. That's not what it's intended to do, but that's kind of what happens. It narrows that curriculum again. This is the stuff that is moderated. This is the stuff that might need some evidence there for schools starting to produce that, that evidence. And the outcomes that's produced are kind of, kind of fascinating. If you just get, look at this for a second. Uh, we know that the new standard, the uh, standard expected for the 100 score, uh, on the scale score is 100, which is the, the new set. And we were told, if you remember, it was going to be about the 4B, something like that. That was a kind of the word that was put, well, not just the word, it was actually in print. That was the kind of uh, stand that was out there. If you actually look and compare, last year the 4B <coughs> or above 69% of kids in reading, writing, and mathematics. If you look at this year, it's so the bottom left hand corner of the, the green. Uh, it's 53% of the national average. So that would suggest to me that the, the expected standard is not quite the old 4B. It's something perhaps a little bit above that. Uh, and if you follow the news, we'll see there's a select committee being uh, going to inquire on primary assessment that was announced a couple of weeks ago. And one of the things that they're looking at is the standard. Have they got it right? Now, getting the standard right is difficult. Uh, I don't dispute that. Um, I've had many years trying to set standards, be it GCSEA level or national tests, as I mentioned, from 2008. And sometimes they get it wrong. And if you're wrong, it's not a bad idea now again just to put your hand up and say, I've got that wrong, and just move that around. And so I think there may be some movement in there. And the select committee will be worth watching, I think, over the next, uh, next month or two. Um, Ofsted, I think, in terms of what they've started to look at, I think is a, a great step forward, personally. I know that Ofsted, not necessarily everybody's favourite, but I think that the way they're shaping up now, the things that they're looking on, spending more time looking at children's work, less time looking at data. I've got evidence this from a number of schools now, where inspectors are spending less time on spreadsheets and spending more time looking at what's going on in the classroom and how that assessment informs teaching and learning. If it's not informing teaching and learning, don't do it. It's not doing its job. And I think that the focus on the way uh, Offset inspectors are shaping up is, is good. I, I, I welcome that. And again, if you've seen the myth busting document they put out, or if you've read the inspection framework, 
you'll see they're putting things there about not expecting a particular format for data, for example. Not asking schools to generate things just for, uh, for offset. Now, I know it's easy for me to say because I'm retired, I know I'm not at the sharp end of it as you are, uh, and Ofsted does seem to have like a, a, a cloud over people. But talking to Sean Harford and others at Ofsted, I, th I think there's a, a good atmosphere, a good mood, and I think there's a, a, a chance for people now to start to do things differently. But we've got to take it. And it does mean uh, being brave a little bit. We have to be brave. And if you want some support, if you look at the teacher workload service, I don't know if, can you speak out if you've read any of the reports of the teacher workload service? I'm impressed on them. Um, there are three, three reports that they produce, and again, if you haven't seen them, it's well worth a look at. They're not long reads. It'd be ironic if they were long reads given to them. They're not. They're quite sharp. And if you look at the executive summary, they're even short. But there are things in there that would actually uh, support the kind of philosophy I'm just going to present to you in a minute or two uh, about focusing assessment on teaching and learning. That is what it's about. It's not about producing charts, pie charts, graphs. In fact, if you listen to the previous presentation just at the end of it, they'll produce some lovely stuff and I'm sure it's all good. But what fascinates me, if the data input is not right, then all the fancy graphs are wrong after that. So if your assessment isn't secure in the first place or valid, every picture that you post after that just means nothing. So getting the data, getting the, the basic information right is important. And if you look at these, again, these are a bit difficult to read on the screen, but I said if you want copies of the slides, you can have them. I'm sure friends and colleagues at uh, Frog would post this somewhere on, on their website if you want them. But basically, they're trying to get people to think differently, to plan resources, to think about planning their curriculum, but do it thoroughly and do it once. Think of it. Tim Oates speaks very well about this. Tim Oates was on the, uh, like the curriculum review. He compares our work with uh, that of other nations, Singapore and Finland and where have you. One of the common things that they do in Finland, for example, which mentioned Finland, uh, is that they, in effect, schools generate their own textbooks. They pull together their resources and generate a textbook. A uh, scheme of work, if you want to call it that, but a rich one with good assessments uh, contained within that. It's hard work up front, it takes a lot of doing, it takes a lot of bearing of the soul, it exposes people's subject knowledge and pedagogic skills. But once you've done it, you've got kind of a sound backbone uh, from which to develop. It should change, it should move all the time, uh, but not significantly from year to year and certainly not from week to week. And again, if you read that planning and teaching resources uh, survey, again, published by the DfE, uh, there's some good ammunition in there, should be really, really challenged on that. Data management, again, uh, the key thing at the bottom is that little word, valid, the point I was making a few minutes ago. If the data, if those assessments are not accurate, uh, and, 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 and valid in the first place, and any data you generate means zilch. It has to be good, solid, valid, reliable assessment in, in the first place. Uh, and again, as the previous speakers made very clear, some good slides about um, making sure that the, the purpose of the data, the audience, was made clear. I like that, that's, that's, that's a, a, a good one. Uh, and again, within data management, again, there's some guided uh, words in there. Uh, how we pull things together, using KPIs, key performance indicators to focus the assessment. And the key thing for me, if you're teaching a child something, at the end of that, you want to know, have they got it or have they not? It's kind of black and white on this. The aim is to teach them something. When you've taught, have they learned? If they haven't learned, you haven't taught. We get to that philosophy if you like, but that's another uh, subject to uh, another debate. So, it does raise, it raise challenges. Um, we need to have better curriculum knowledge, and again, the schools I'm going to mention in a few minutes have spent a lot of time actually talking through the curriculum. That was the starting point for them. They didn't fly off to how we replace our people to generate data. They went back to the basics, a new curriculum. Some of their academies, they don't have to follow the curriculum, uh, but obviously they follow most of it because maths doesn't differ from one, from one area to another, basically, and you're all uh, assessed by the same tests. Again, that was the starting point, but that again really digs into subject knowledge. And again, with a more demanding curriculum, Key Stage 2 in particular, uh, as, as, as staff equipped to, to handle all those things. And we certainly need to think more about transition at Key Stage 2 and 3. Uh, one of the last things I did at, at QC here before, before leaving, we set up a little, uh, little project called Journey of a Child. Uh, the idea was we wanted to look at our assessment 
uh, was undertaken from the age of five to 18. The data, the information that was generated, how that was used, how it was used for that particular child. Now obviously we couldn't follow up children from five to 18, because I'm running out of time, as it's pretty obvious. Um, so we had to do that in a much shorter time scale. So we went into five local authorities. We went to an infant school, then a junior, then a secondary, an FE college or sixth form all connected in some way by the children who went through the students and we looked at the data that was produced, the information and what happened at the next school when it was passed on. The most startling one, the most blunt one, but really kind of summed it up, was an infant school in the West Midlands uh, who I thought did some superb work in terms of assessment. They generated some good, valid stuff. They didn't generate masses of data, masses of you know, battle loads full of uh, of exemplification or proof or whatever, it's just sufficient to pass on. They passed it on to the junior school, so we went off to that junior school and said, okay, you get all this stuff, what do you do with it? The head said, and I quote, we bin it. We bin it. And when I asked, why do you bin it? Because we don't touch that lot down there and inflate the results, etc., etc. Now, it was blown, but that kind of message went right the way through the system. And again, there's some really good, rich stuff in there that actually told us something about the kids that a level or a grade never does. It told us what a child can do and what they yet to do. And it's that the stuff that we can, we can focus on. So we've got to build that trust, we've got to work on that trust, because if we don't trust each other, we can't expect ministers and others to give us that trust. So we've got a big, a big job of work to do. And if you've heard me talk before, some of you will have seen uh, this slide. I did a, a little course for the NHT a couple of years ago now. Uh, and one of the first things that I asked them to do, groups of head teachers sat in tables of six, you know, you've been through all this before many times, we just asked them, now that levels are going, what's your plan, what's your instinct, what are you, you going to do? And the, the six round the table came up with these things, are we going to use one, two, three, uh, one below, two up, three above, that was the kind of thing. Somebody said, that's not fine, we don't have to object, we don't have granularity in that, that was the word, that was the phrase, so we're using a 14 point scale, well, good on it. Um, that was better by someone who said, well, we've been told that numbers are the work of the devil, so we're going to use colours, and there are green, red, um, and amber, which kind of equated to one, two, and three in a spooky sort of a way. Uh, the next head teacher said we're using the same system, I'm not sure that one red equaled the same red as the other school. Uh, another school said we're using the Sheffield system, I don't know if you're familiar with that, which goes on a massive scale from like not 260, but that follows right the way through, you know, from 5 to, uh, to 18. Um, and then someone else said we're using the early year stuff, the emerging and what have you. Uh, and then the last one came up with this one, fruit. <laughs> um, now this, as I said, two years ago, I kind of, you know, used to giggle at this and it was odd at the time. Um, all the other people giggled at, at fruits as well, the other heads right, they could see their hands over the face and looking down. I thought 92 was as funny, quite honestly. Now what's 92? And how does 92 differ to 93? If a child says, I've got 92, that's great, how do I get 93? You're going to need to, to tell them, you need to explain that. And I don't, again, emerging and these other things, we're using these terms of bandied about, but I'm sure we've got very different pictures up here in our own minds of what emerging might look like. But the reason I've put it up on here recently, I came up with this one. Someone is using dog breeds as ways of labelling children. So rather than emerging out of the chihuahuas or alces, we dog breeds. So we've still got that issue. But all of them are in the same category for me. They've all got issues. Emerging doesn't crack it for me. It's no better or different to 92. So, do you want numbers? And again, this goes right the way through. <coughs> Stage C, flight paths, I think Sean Humphries from the NHT and Google this, you can get millions of responses to flight paths. Many of them are about aeroplanes, I'll admit it, uh, but more are coming from secondary schools who, who are hell bent on getting these flight paths of prediction. And if you try to predict now what, how your children in, uh, in, in year three are going to do in uh, at key stage tests, I suggest you start building information and data. We can't predict as yet. It's false to predict, you're just guessing. Assessment experts will tell you that. If you build up data over the next few years, you'll be able to look back in a few years and look at patterns and clubs that will inform future uh, predictions, but not, not just yet. So we need to get to a place where you start collecting uh, information that is actually, uh, actually usable. And I think 
what I'm coming across in schools is this little kind of birch cage syndrome. We've got the door has been opened, levels have allowed uh, the door of assessment to be open. And I've seen some colleagues who've, who've left the cage, they fly. That some of them are not there yet, a lot of them are not there yet, but they're making a hell of a good go at it. Uh, and then there are others who are kind of making their way back into the cage. They've had a little look around, they've panicked and gone in. And there are some who are still sat on the perch wondering what do I do about it. And again, it's just kind of a sign of the confidence that we've got. So, in terms of all practical stuff now, and again, all of this stuff is available now from here on in. This is not just me uh, making this up. This is all stuff that you can find uh, that other people have done, other schools in particular, and I'll point you to the source of those. Uh, the NHT put together a uh, framework, NHT assessment framework, I don't know whether you're familiar with that. Uh, but again, it's kind of a practical way, it's a useful way, I think, of thinking, conceptualising what we need to do going forward now in terms of uh, being a success, success, can't say it, a successful uh, education system. It looks like that, and again, if you go on the NHT website or the Life After Levels uh, website, you'll, you'll find this and it'll explain it. Uh, more elegant than I'll explain it now, but simply put, it starts off on the left hand side with developing the curriculum. That is for me the place to start. This is what we do in schools, we teach kids stuff. So we want to work out what is that stuff and in what order are we going to do it. So getting the curriculum right is the first thing. And doing it together, not just the year two teacher going off into a darkened room or the year nine teacher into a darkened room. It's collectively. You can start off in a darkened room if you wish, but then you come together and you lay it on the table. You discuss it, you talk about it, and it's challenging. It's harder than it looks because people will start to question why you're teaching that in year three or why you're not teaching that in year four. You will be challenged and you should be challenged. That's the way it should go. But once you've got that, once you've got that sorted out, and that is a major job, you then start to think, you know, how are we going to check that? How are we going to assess it? In the bottom left hand corner, that would care about this idea of key performance indicators. You can't assess everything. You don't need to assess everything. It would be madness to assess everything. Maths, year two or year one and two together, there's like 72 learning objectives in the national curriculum. If you multiply that by the 30 kids in your classroom, that's an awful lot of assessments you're going to go on everything. So the philosophy behind this is to focus on the big ideas, the key concepts, the things that kind of suck up other things, if you like. And determining those KPIs again is a fantastic exercise to do. I've seen people get into blows over this. Uh, the ones that are published on the NHC website, we worked up those, we worked those up with about 70 odd secondary teachers. And people kind of prefer to go to the wall over thinking over that, what should be a KPI and what shouldn't. It's an interesting debate about what are the key things that tell you a child of six <coughs> understands maths as a six year old. It's a great, great debate to have. However, once you've got that, you can then start to collect kids' work along the side of that. That gives you stuff to assess, but it also gives you the chance of producing exemplification. And for me, this is another crucial step. It's all very well us talking about um, fluent readers. She's a fluent reader. What does that mean? What does it look like? Now, again, I can try to explain it, but it's probably easy just to show a kid doing it. If we expect children to know the times tables or whatever, we can say that we expect them to know that. But we can show we can evidence that. We can show how they apply that in other contexts. We can capture it now with the technology that we have to hand. It doesn't have to be all things written down, for God's sake. It be things that we've seen, that we've heard. Uh, and we can kind of build, build a picture. But we can save some of that stuff. Because if we've got that, we can then articulate to one another uh, what this actually looks like. And that uh, helps us to produce what we call school standards file. So we can print on the wall what, what we expect of a 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 year old right on the wall. And we can walk through that. We can look at it, we can discuss it, we can argue about it, we can change it, we can modify it over time as we should be. But that will start to give us a picture of what those words actually mean in the products of children's, children's learning. And if you've got that for your school, you can then compare it and share it with other schools which is a good thing, just to give us that security of understanding. If other schools share our standard, that's, that's kind of helpful, that's really sure. So, uh, KPI is the way that's done, simply looking at stuff that's in the curriculum, that's just an extract, and we basically said, okay, of that reading year one, what are the key things you look for in a child at the end of that course, and this is the list that they came up with. Now, you might disagree with that list, and that's great. 
It's one of the things that I'm proposing, if you look at the KPIs and the NHT framework, don't just take it as some schools have done and download it and run with it. I want you to challenge every one of those KPIs, discuss every one, because they might have got it wrong. Your know, view might be different or better. So don't just take things, download them, stick them on the website, jump them. It really is about getting into them and challenging. And if you think one of those that's been greyed out is more important, put it back in. But at the end of the day, you want to try and keep it into limiting. Remember the workload. If you made all of those into <coughs> key performance indicators, one, well, they're not key. And two, you're then spending time and time and time assessing those things and for little, for little, that little feedback. Uh, so if you go on the uh, NHC website, you'll find there's a whole bunch of these Life After Levels website has got them now. Uh, you'll have all the KPIs, you can look at them. It's a starting point, you know, so I don't think it's the finishing point, it's the starting point. And there's also the addition of some things about what kind of performance we expect at the end of each year. And all the words on the right hand side are tech from the National Curriculum. If you look in the National Curriculum, you'll find lots of clues. It says, use phrases like, by the end of year seven children can. All those steps are taken from there. And that gives us a bit of a picture. And then you can record that. This is an early one that was done. This is basically down the left hand side children's names across the top, the KPIs. Uh, they started off with kind of a binary thing. Can the child do it or can they not? It's a one or it's a zero. Uh, but then the threes crept in and one of the dangers is then fours creep in and other people are four plus and four minus and it starts to dismantle. My view is much purer than that. If I want a child to do X, can they do X, yes or no? And if they can't, what are we going to do about it? That's the focus. So that's kind of what our, what our job is. If you've got a system uh, and you want to get some assurance on that, again, uh, the people over that, the Chatham Institute of Education assessors, uh, have an excellence in assessment course which will get a chartered, uh, chartered assessor into your school to look at what you do with your processes. Uh, not just at the little results that pop out there and all your data, but the entire process of assessment. So that's kind of worth a little look at. Uh, and then two other things I just want to mention very quickly. One is standardisation, the other is moderation. Uh, when you're looking at examples of children's work, two things come into mind. One is we're trying to set a standard. This is the standard that we want to stick up on the wall to say this is what year two writing looks like. And someone <laughs> needs to be in the school who's like a chief examiner almost or a candidate sign off of that. Moderation is simply the process of making sure people are applying that standard. Now any of those terms used interchangeably in schools, they're two very, very, very different processes. And you cannot moderate unless you've set a standard. If you're sitting around chatting about kids' work and you're calling that moderation and you haven't got a standard held up in front of you, you're not moderating. I'm not totally sure what you're doing, but it, it ain't moderation. You must set a standard. Um, in terms of the uh, exemplification work that NHT uh, and, uh, and Frog have produced together in the Life After Levels, they've been through the KPIs that they've put uh, on, uh, on the website. And for each of the KPIs, they started to generate examples of children's work, which are annotated. Now, all of these, again, I think these are coming out today on the Life After Levels website, certainly the next few hours, next few days, they will be out there. You can look at them. And again, if you look at them, they're there for reading, writing, mathematics. There's a mixture of videos and, and photocopies of kids' work with comments and justifications for why they think that standard has been hit. Have a look at them. If you disagree with them, that's equally fine by me. If you've got better examples, share them, submit them. So that's the only way we're going to kind of develop, I think, professionally, to get a really good uh, set of, of materials. The materials were produced by these good folk. Uh, again, the list is, is there in front of you. Uh, developing the curriculum, uh, Rainwood School in Othersfield and Featherstone in Erdington, which is uh, part of Birmingham. Uh, there's some videos that are going to go on the Life After Levels website over the next week or two, next week or so, not week or two, week or so, uh, which gives you an insight into what these folk have done. Their focus, and they're very clear about this, was about developing the curriculum. They talk about, the teachers talk about what they did, how they did, how they kind of ongo with that, with progress meetings, with sharing work, talking about work. Exemplification, those five schools there came together, they produced their own exemplification work, they talked about it hard and fast in school, then they sat down with the four other schools and put that on the table and shared it and took comments uh, from other colleagues. Again, that is a brave thing to do. This is someone standing up and saying, this is what I think a, a year five 
mathematician should be able to do. You're there to be kind of tackled, to be shot at. It's brave. Once you get into it, it's brilliant. You find it kind of flow and you build confidence. But those five schools produce the exemplification materials that are uh, up on, on the site. And they all have processes behind that, which again are captured in video, which you can, you can, actually, you can actually see. Uh, monitoring performance, Featherstone and East Whitbeck. Again, looking at the, at the data that was uh, produced in, in the previous session, I don't know if some of you were in that. Uh, there's a whole tons of data starting to be, to be spurred out into the system from Fisher Family Trust, from the department, from local authorities. Um, what these folk are doing is looking at something that works for them within the school, that looks, as, that looks to capture what children have done as they move from one year to the next, to get sufficient information from which to make judgments. But they're still working on, on that, it's still ongoing in, in my book, they're still teasing the cells about it's not quite levels, do we make it like levels, the scheme has to be pulling it back to KPIs. But again, the work that they're doing is well, well worth looking at. And then finally, a bit on there, at uh, key stage at, at two and three, uh, leads local authorities with a meeting the end of the week looking at uh, key stage two to three with practitioners from both sides, again using data that is generated on Rays Online that comes back about item analysis in the test. You can look it up for your class, your school, uh, individual children to look at the questions in the key stage test that they struggle with. And you can compare that with performance uh, nationally. That gives you a clue. And the second colleagues in particular were struck about that meeting. The thing that was hanging over there was the year seven repeat, the reset. That's the thing that was motivated that. Because again, if the children reset and they blob again, who takes the hit for that? who was accountable for that one. Uh, and what they were trying to do is to ascertain where do we need to focus our teaching. Their view, their goal, I think was local. Rather than repeat the entire key stage two curriculum, they wanted to focus in on what is it the kids didn't actually know. And they're looking at a project to, to get data and information across from primary to secondaries of uh, that nature. That's going to get bigger, that kind of uh, interface. Uh, and then the last one on there I mentioned, over Trinity Academy, uh, they have a master curriculum again, interesting there that they're working, this is a secondary maths, so working with primary schools, in fact they've seconded primary teachers into this project to look at maths working from one year to the next on a master model, a fairly strict master model, but again one worth, worth looking at. Uh, if you want further support, there's, there's quite a bit of it about now, um, again it's listed uh, on, on there. <coughs> You've got, or you will get, as you, as you leave colleagues uh, from from Frog Education, who are, who are overseeing the Life After Levels website. Uh, they've got some pieces of paper that can direct you to that, so you can find it easier. Uh, they're also proposing, or not proposing, they're going to be running some uh, some training courses that really get into all the detail. There's from curriculum right through to assessment methodology, etc. Uh, again, you can contact them for uh, for details on that. And as I said, all of this, I believe, will be on the Life After Levels website, which you can look at.